Um, thanks, Ryan, and thanks everybody for uh, for uh, coming to my talk today. Um, so the title of the talk here is Probabilistic Perspectives on Meta and Reinforcement Learning. So uh, buried in here is also that's going to be we use a lot of deep learning technology. So any conditional distribution, any function that you see is all neural networks, um, and also that's buried in here. There will also be some uh, um, ideas from okay, okay from Bayesian non primary tricks as well. So it's, it's a bit kind of integrative, I guess. Kind of brings together all of diff the different strands of machine learning that I've worked on over the years. And uh, this is um, joint work, um, actually multiple papers, with lots of um, uh, co-authors uh, from DeepMind. Um, it's, it's been great working there. It's very collaborative. You can see the number of collaborators on the various papers. Uh, particularly, I think the, the uh, people in the first two roles have been kind of, I've been interacted I've been interacting uh, the most with on on the various papers here. Okay, so I'll I'll have their their little photos on the relevant aspects uh, on the relevant slides um, of the talk. Okay, so I'll start. So I'll start with reinforcement learning. So just to kind of set the scene a bit. So we have an an agent that interacts with an with an environment, right? So the agent sees observations from the environment and also rewards as well, and the agent sees the uh, history of observations and its actions in this environment and it has to decide what to do next. So it picks a, um, an action, it could be continuous, it could be discrete, and the action then affects the environment which then kind of um, sends back new observations and new rewards to the agent. And the aim of the agent is to maximize the expected uh, sum of rewards uh, discounted uh, that, is, uh, that it gets from the environment. Um, and what we're interested in here is uh, not just reinforcement learning, but also efficient reinforcement learning. So we would like our agent to learn very quickly from a small number of interactions with the, uh, with the environment. Okay. And of course, if you only have a small number of interactions, a uh, small amount of data that you get from the environment, then in order to do well, the information has to come from, from somewhere else. So this is kind of brings up this notion of prior knowledge, right? We like to have inductive biases and prior knowledge that the agent has in order to generalize quickly from a small amount of data that it gets uh, on this particular environment, okay? And there's lots of different ways about uh, building in prior knowledge into our, our um, agents. And I think a lot of machine learning is about that. You know, how do we structure our graphical models? How do we structure our neural networks? Um, the properties that, and that our models should have, things like, um, around symmetries um, um, and so on, like convolutional architectures, for example, translation invariance, right? So, um, and in this talk, I would like to focus on a way in which we can learn the prior knowledge from data itself. And in particular, if the agent has interact, or at least the system has interacted with lots of maybe other tasks, um, that are slightly, uh, that are kind of related to the current one that we're interested in, then perhaps there's transferable information that can, that the agent can use from these other tasks, okay? And if you think about this, there's kind of a few ways in which, uh, a few things that, um, that knowledge can be transferred from other tasks to this task that we're interested in, okay? And in a sense, the uh, meta and the reinforcement learning part of my talk has to do with kind of two different types of knowledge that we can transfer. So we can imagine that in the uh, policies and the agents, and uh, in the policies and the solutions that the agent comes up with, there might be reusable components in that. So for, uh, for example, policies might be composed of multiple options or skills that we can reuse across different tasks. Um, and, and that leads to kind of like two sets, uh, two sets of, uh, of results that we've, we've been looking at in terms of transferring structure in our policies and solutions from uh, um, across different tasks, okay? Um, on the other hand, you can also think about structure in the environment itself, the kind of regularities in the environment. And um, the, the, the idea of the second part of this talk is about um, how do we kind of reuse this 
um, structure in the environment um, in, in model-based um, approaches to, um, to transfer, basically. Okay. Right, so I'll start with the first one. So just to set a bit of um, notation, um, so this is the same kind of reinforcement learning uh, diagram that we have here. So we have, mm, why is my mouse not working? Okay, so, um, so pi is gonna be our policy, which is simply we can think of as the distribution over actions that the agent can take um, given the state that it, that it is in. And we are going to model this with a Markov decision process. So, so the state is the state of the environment that's given by S. And given an action that the agent has taken, which is drawn from the policy, from the policy distribution, the environment will then draw the next state, ST plus 1, from its transition model, or from its transition dynamics. And also there's a reward that's simply a function of the current state and the current action. And the environment sends the reward and uh, should be the next state, st plus one, to the agent. And this is kind of the, the loop that happens between the agent and the environment. And what we'd like to do is to maximize the expected discounted uh, reward uh, with respect to the policy that the agent takes, the, with respect to the policy that the agent has and from which it draws its, its actions from. Okay. So um, it's a... I guess you can think of uh, the uh, loop here of states and actions as forming a, a trajectory, and that's a Markov model, right? And that's why this is called a Markov decision process. Okay. okay. Um, and the setup that we're interested in here is, the, is uh, called KL regularized reinforcement learning, and it's the, the, uh, the reason is simple. Basically, uh, in addition to the expected uh, 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 returns that we'll like our agent to maximize. We're going to regularize the, uh, the policy using a KL uh, re a divergence term. Okay? And this is given by the second term here, which is, uh, if you pull in the expectation here, you see that this is a, um, basically a KL divergence from the policy to some default policy, pi naught. Okay? So we can think of well, the first term is the expected reward, as I said. Um, and the second term is the KL divergence, right? And this is a KL divergence towards some default behavior, okay? And you can think of this default behavior is, as um, the behavior that the agent could have uh, before it actually sees this particular task, okay? And then finally, um, for, um, we also have uh, so if you look at the KL divergence, there's one of the terms here, which is expectation under pi of log of pi. Right? And that's an entropy term, which we would like to maximize. Um, and the idea of this entropy term, of maximizing this entropy term, is that we'll also prefer diverse solutions as well. So we would like to get policies. We would like to, uh, uh, basically what this um, objective is kind of saying is that, uh, if there are multiple actions that we can take and they all have ac the same expected reward and, th and then we should um, spread our probability in our policy across these actions. Okay, so we would like to prefer diversity in the actions that we take. Okay. And if you come from a probabilistic modeling background and you look at this equation, you can probably see that, well, I, this is very similar to a variational um, the variational um, objective in variational inference, right? So the expected reward is basically like a log likelihood term. Um, the default po uh, policy is basically a prior term, while the policy itself, pi, is a, is a posterior term, is a variational posterior term, okay? Um, and I think that this, this way of looking at what KL regularized reinforcement learning is doing is, is quite, um, are useful because it kind of emphasizes the role of this prior and the role of the uh, KL divergence in terms of regularizing towards the prior. Okay. Um, so I'd like to say here that um, there's been a lot of different work in reinforcement learning that takes this KL reg regularized or entropy regularized um, approach. Most of them have been in the optimization type of um, 
uh, um, approach to, to, to solving reinforcement learning. So, so things like uh, uh, trust region policy optimization, proximal policy optimization, and so forth. Okay. Right, but here we're gonna take a more probabilistic view of this particular objective. Okay. Um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you solve this objective function, um, it, um, imagine that we can actually optimize and solve fully for the best policy that optimizes this, uh, this objective. We see that the optimal pi is proportional to the prior pi naught times uh, the exponentiation of, uh, of the uh, action value function Q. Okay. And you can think of this um, Q as basically the log likelihood of uh, future rewards. Okay. Right. And um, so you can think of, um, so I'd like to kind of draw a picture and, and I think this could be quite useful. Um, imagine that we have a space of trajectories, okay? Um, and every point in, in this space corresponds to one policy that the agent could have. And in this space, there could be a number of different policies which leads to trajectories uh, which have high rewards, okay? And this could be, uh, there could be a bunch of this. Um, and that's drawn by this little kind of a Gaussian here. Um, and then we could also have um, another set of uh, policies or trajectories which has high probability under the, under the default or the prior behavior. Okay? And that's given by this other Gaussian. And the posterior is basically the product of the likelihood with the prior. And so the policies, uh, the posterior uh, policies which have, um, which optimizes this objective basically corresponds to policies which, um, which agree with the constraints given by both the likelihood term and the prior term, okay? Um, so you can think of this as uh, the set of policies that maximizes our reward subject to the fact that subject to it not being too far away from, from the prior. Okay. Okay. You can also think about um, optimizing this objective with respect to the prior as well. Okay. And if you uh, look at the terms in this objective, then basically the optimal prior, so if you maximize this objective with respect to the prior, um, it's going to take this form. So this is basically the, the parts of the objective that, that, uh, that uh, involves the prior, okay? And you can see that this is basically a um, supervised learning problem where the data is coming from our, uh, from our um, policy. Um, and we're trying to learn to fit the prior to, to actions under our policy. And you can also think about, um, imagine now that we have a distribution over task. So uh, just to refer back to this idea that we would like to kind of learn some prior knowledge from multiple tasks that the agent has interacted with in the past. Um, imagine that we have a distribution over tasks, then the objective that we'd like to optimize is simply um, the average of the same objective um, over the tasks that um, that we have in that in our distribution, okay. and for each task, we may have a sp specific task-specific uh, policy that we'd like to optimize, and there's a shared prior, and you can think of that shared prior as trying to capture uh, the regularities across the policies which are optimal across our different tasks. Okay, and so the optimal prior here is um, basically given by um, supervised learning where the, where the data is coming from uh, the optimal policies across the tasks in our distribution. Okay. And um, again here, I think a picture is useful. So imagine now that we have a bunch of different tasks. For each task, we have a set of uh, policies which, uh, which are well performing um, under the task. Okay. Then the optimal prior is 
should be kind of fit to, to, th to this set of policies. Okay. So imagine that um, our space here is, uh, is uh, um, that, um, sorry, if, um, imagine that our policy here is kind of parameterized by a Gaussian, then for example, uh, you could fit an axis, uh, um, a, uh, a symmetric Gaussian, a kind of circular Gaussian, Gaussian to, to this set of policies, then we'll get a, uh, a set of trajectories that are kind of, uh, sorry, as we'll get a prior which kind of is fit to, to this set of policies, okay? Uh, and that's kind of a Gaussian that fits this set. And you can also change, uh, you know, the structure of the prior policy and you could get kind of different forms for the optimal prior. So this could be a kind of a full covariance Gaussian and that, that's gonna fit to, to our uh, policies um, for kind of the optimal policies across tasks, um, average over the tasks, okay. Right, and you can think of this prior now as basically reducing um, the space that we're gonna explore from the space of all possible policies to the space of policies which is kind of likely under this, which is uh, sensible under this, under this distribution um, over tasks, okay. So, and another way of thinking about this is that, um, so the task specific policies gets information about each policy is indexed by W, which is our, our task. So the task specific policies uh, get information about the task that the agent is, is that the agent wants to solve, but the prior is um, task agnostic in the sense that it doesn't get that task information, okay? So if you imagine parameterizing both the default policy and the task a specific policy using neural networks, then um, for the task specific, uh, specific policy, uh, we can imagine a neural network that takes two inputs, the state information and the task information, and produces a distribution um, over actions. Okay. On the other hand, for the default policy, it doesn't get to see the task uh, information, so it's simply a neural network that takes the state and produces some uh, default distribution over actions. Okay. And in that perspective, you can think about um, structuring our policies, both the task specific policies and the uh, default policy uh, using kind of what I've described before. So here's a problem which I'd like to kind of demonstrate what's happening. Um, we have, is it okay if I kind of talk away from the mic, you think? So we have two policies here. We have a task-specific policy and a default policy. And we have a KL divergence between the distributions of, on actions uh, given by the two, two policies. Um, our states here in this problem is given by actually two types. There's a proprioceptive information, which is basically related to the body of the agents and exteroceptive information, which is related to the location of the box. And the idea here is that the agent has to figure out that it has to go to the box and push the box to one of these two targets and go to the other target. Okay, so this is a, that's the task. And basically, uh, our distribution on tasks has to do with initial distribution over where the body is located, where the box is located, and where the two targets are. Uh, we also have a task information here as well, which describes basically the location of the, of the targets. And you can imagine that um, the difference between the task specific policy and the default policy is access to the task information. Basically, the default policy gets to only see the state while the task a specific policy gets to see the task information too. Okay. And if you train this agent across a set of tasks in this domain, then you can see kind of a quite interesting behavior, I think. So actually I'll show you the video first. Okay. So this is optimal behavior in terms of uh, 
for a specific task. So the agent knows how to move the box to the, tar to the target and to move to the other target. Okay. You can also look at the behavior of the agent under the default uh, policy. Um, and there's two default policies that we could, two forms of the default policy that we could look at. The first one is um, a, a policy that only gets to see the proprioceptive information. Okay. So basically, yeah, and not the exteroceptive. Um, okay, so to replay this, okay. And um, the default policy basically corresponds to uh, the agent moving around at random in the environment. Okay. Um, so it doesn't really care about the box itself, doesn't care about the target, it just moves around. Um, and then there's a, another form of the default behavior in which it gets to see both the box and the proprioceptive information, in which case it moves the box around, it goes to the box and it moves the box around at random around this environment. Okay. And you can see that this is quite a reasonable behavior because if it doesn't care about what, about where to move the box, then it should, but it knows that in this particular set of tasks, it should always be pushing the box around the place then it just pushes the box around the place at random. Okay. And you can also see that this default policy is quite useful to for tasks in this domain, right? because it's not just uh, moving its arms and legs uh, at random, it's actually doing sensible behavior for, for this domain. It's kind of moving around, it's pushing the box, it just doesn't know where the task is under the default behavior. And you can also see that that sort of default behavior allows it to explore this space much more efficiently than if we, were, were, if we were starting from scratch. Okay. You can also look at the learning curves um, of this agent, and you can see that it, it, would, it does a, um, a lot better. So we have a baseline agent, um, which is a, um, uh, it's a SVG0 agent with kind of a retrace. Um, it's kind of a, quite a bit of details, but we take a baseline agent, and we can kind of add this KL regularization and learning the, the uh, prior policy um, along with it. And you can see that uh, if you add a prior policy which only sees proprioceptive inf information, then it learns faster. If the prior is a bit more structured, uh, in that it, it also gets to see the, the location of the box, then it learns even faster. You can now also think about uh, taking this learns prior and transferring it to, to a new task. And you can see that uh, the transfer is, is kind of learns even faster. Okay. So, so once we have trained our, our agent, actually our default policy on this set of tasks, you can, uh, you can train an agent on a new task, in fact, out of domain, um, using that, that default prior, and it kind of learns faster than the baseline. So there are kind of two tasks that we have here. So one is this M to push the box into one of the locations and to move to the other location. And, and this is a task where we have to move this box to one of the three locations. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so looking at this problem, this reinforcement learning problem from a, pro a probabilistic learning lens, then um, it also kind of, um, makes sense to start thinking about whether it's possible to introduce latent variables in our, into our uh, models as well. Okay? And, and latent variables, as, as we know, is very useful in, in, gra in graphical models because it allows us to kind of introduce um, additional structure in, uh, into our graphical model and additional flexibility in, in terms of the distributions that the graphical model uh, can model as well. So now imagine that our policy is this uh, distribution over trajectories. Um, it, it has a latent variable. There's a typo here. So this should be uh, distribution on trajectories given a latent variable times uh, distribution on latent variables and then inti inti integrating out the latent variables. Um, and uh, coming back to this diagram here, right? So, uh, if this is the set of um, task-specific policies that could be 
uh, yeah, so if this is the set of tasks, a specific policy, and we want to fit our prior distribution on, uh, on trajectories onto this set. So if we fit a Gaussian, then it kind of looks like that. But you can also imagine that if this thing is a bit more structured, for example, uh, uh, you know, if it's kind of curved in this space, then what we might want to do is to fit a mixture of Gaussians. And of yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, um, if the set of policies here is kind of curved in this space, then we'd like to fit a mixture of Gaussians, and you can think of a mixture of Gaussians as having a latent variable which indicates the component that the um, trajectory is coming from. Right. And there's also kind of other different ways in which you can think about using latent variables in this context because we have a kind of a sequential decision making uh, context. You can think about one latent variable that there exists one latent variable at each time step. Okay. So the generative process is given the current state, we first generate our latent variable and then we generate our, our action and then that gives us the next state and we just can repeat this. And this is useful particularly in the continuous control context because typically the policies that we use is actually a Gaussian distribution over actions. And a Gaussian distribution over actions may not be sensible particularly if there are kind of multimodal behavior. So imagine that the agent is standing here and there are two optimal policies either to go uh, left or to go right. Okay. And then you can use the latent variable to kind of describe this multimodal behavior. A more complex distribution over action uh, given the current state. You can also think about latent variables that in which there's only one and that's drawn at the beginning of the, uh, of the um, task and you can think of this as goal conditional policy. So the agent first picks a goal given by the latent variable and then it explores the, the environment according to that goal. Okay. We can also have a bit more structure here so in which case uh, there's kind of an arrow going from the previous latent variable to the next one and you can think of this as modeling temporal correlations or options for example okay in which the agent picks a goal it and then it does a number of actions according to that goal and it might switch to a different goal and, and does that so you can think of this as uh, there's one option for moving forward another option for turning left and and, and so forth okay so it's quite useful to, to think about kind of how do we structure the, our, our policy this way using latent variables. I think. Okay. So, um, so coming back to, to this problem, so we have this thing where we have our task specific policy and a default policy. Right? Um, if we introduce latent variables, okay, we, um, it turns out that it could actually uh, upper bound this resulting objective in terms of uh, actually two KL terms now, there's a KL term on the latent variables and another one which is on the actions or the, or the trajectories given the choice of the latent variables. Okay. And this kind of gives us kind of a structure for our policies which is now a bit more complicated. So, so now you can imagine that we have a high level policy and a low level policy and you can think of the high level policies as setting the high level goals of the agent while the low level policies is executing those kind of high level goals in terms of moving its legs around. Uh, you can also imagine different forms of, uh, of parameterizations of each of these four different policies in terms of the information that it gets to see. Right? So you can imagine that our high level task specific policy gets to see the task information as well as the state. Our default prior doesn't get to see the task. Um, and we can also imagine that uh, the low level policies get to see the state or potentially even uh, not to see the uh, exteroceptive information but only the proprioceptive in, um, information for example. Okay. So we can kind of play around with different sort of structures that, um, that we think is sensible for the tasks. Another thing that you could do is to say, well, um, maybe at this low level, it 
may not make sense to distinguish between uh, this uh, task specific kind of low level policy with, uh, with the default policy. You can Im imagine that we set the two to be exactly the same. They are sharing the same parameters. Okay. In which case the second KL term disappears. Okay. So you can think of this now as uh, learning reusable kind of low level controllers or skills for our, for our um, agents. show you the video okay so um, so again we have our uh, task specific policy and it, it knows how to kind of push the box to the targets okay and if you look at the prior then it it uh, it um, should just be kind of pushing the box at random around the place okay and again you can show that um, this kind of works really well and it gives, gives us different ways about transfer as well. So you can imagine that uh, you might want to transfer the low level policy in, in the case where we think that the task, um, the dynamics on the environment is the same across different tasks. Um, um, or we can think about transferring high level um, policies and relearning the low level policies in the case where the goal of the tasks are the same but the, the dynamics are different. Um, so here's a little video in which um, we have trained our agent on a task which is simply to move the box to the target. Okay? Um, but the difference between the training tasks and the test tasks is that in the training task the boxes are much lighter, but in the test tasks the boxes are, are heavier. Okay? So in, in this case the goal should stay the same. The high level goal should stay the same, but the low level policy that ex executes the kind of movements of the agent sh should differ between uh, pushing a lighter box around and pushing a heavier box around. And you can see that initially, oh, sorry. Okay. So um, initially, the agent's low level policy isn't very adapted, so it's it's finding it difficult to push, to push the box around, and, but we can adapt this low level policy and it can push it much uh, better after, after that. Okay. okay, any questions about this bit here? Yes? Uh, do you have some variables actually in the variable POMDP partial cell? Um, in, this, in this set, they are not really related to POMDPs, um, they are just ways of making the policies more expressive. Yeah, it's not really part of the environment. Okay, um, okay. so that's another different way in which you could um, uh, uh, in which you could think about kind of learning prior um, uh, knowledge from data. Okay, so this is um, using, I think, some of these control techniques for controlling a humanoid body. And we are simply wanting the, the agent to move as quickly as possible. And you can see that it has really weird um, behavior. It's not really human-like at all, right? And it doesn't conform to our prior of what is sensible motion for humans. Of course, part, part of the reason for this is because our model of the body isn't accurate enough for it to have accurate human uh, behavior and, and also we don't have things like uh, trying to minimize the energy that the agent uses to move forward for example okay. uh, but um, in talking about what is sensible prior what is sensible behavior for controlling a human body so we do have lots of data that has that can give us interesting prior information about what is sensible behavior right so um, sorry Okay, so we can train our agent from actually demonstrations of, of uh, actually um, actual humans uh, 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 moving around using mocap data, right? So we can get lots of mocap data. There's lots of uh, open source mocap uh, 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 data out there. And we can, for each of this, uh, clips, mocap clips, so for each of these mocap uh, motion capture uh, trajectories, 
of the, of the body, we can train an individual agent to reproduce that, that behavior. Okay. So if we have lots of clips, then we can train lots of different agents, which are expert agents for uh, uh, reproducing those different motions. Okay. Um, and in the same way that we have task-specific policies and we can use supervised learning to learn a sensible prior, we can now uh, take each of these task-specific policies, we can generate trajectories from them, and then we can train a single supervised learning um, uh, we can train a single default uh, a policy which uh, can reproduce all of these different um, reasonable looking human uh, 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 motion. Okay. And the way we can do uh, kind of, and the way we structure this is actually this uh, default behavior actually gets to see two things. Uh, it gets to see the state information, which is the body pose and the kind of, the velocities and so forth. And it also gets to see a latent variable which you could interpret as a kind of a motor intention. Okay. So the idea here is the following. So um, we would like to model the conditional distribution of actions that the agent takes given the states. So given the sequence of, of uh, poses that we want the agent to be in. Okay. So we want to model that, that conditional distribution and we can introduce a latent variable and under this latent variable, there's a prior, and there's a posterior as well, Q. And the way we structure this posterior is that the posterior gets to see future states that the agent is in. So it chooses, so it gets to choose uh, latent states that leads it to the future states, okay, uh, future pose of the, of the body. Um, and we can actually formalize this as a kind of a variational inference problem in this graphical model. And can optimize this by kind of uh, supervised learning using trajectories obtained from the individual agents. Okay. And this produces much nicer results. So, so now you can see that we have a human body that can jump across uh, gaps uh, and it's much more uh, sensible now. Okay. And we have also have a body that can move around and kind of uh, pick up balls, basically, okay, around a maze. Um, okay. That's kind of re reasonable. Um, and you can also have the agent kind of push the box like the ants to, to a target location as well. Okay, so. okay. And you can see that the, the motions of the, of the agent is much more sensible now. Okay, so um, right. So in the second part of the talk, um, I'll be talking about kind of. So in the in the first part, we've been talking about transferable structure in the space of policies, right? And a lot of these are model-free um, approaches. Um, in the second part, I'd like to talk about kind of model-based approaches in which we actually learn the a model of the environment and we and we use that. Okay, and here the approach that we're going to take is basically meta-learning with neural processes. Okay. Okay, so the idea here is the following. So imagine that we have a, a bunch of interactions of an agent with an environment, and each of these interactions is given the history of the agent, given the history that of actions and, and states that the agent has seen in the past, the agent has to pick the next action, and uh, oh, I'm sorry it should be actually states here. So this should be uh, given the history and an action, uh, the agent sees the next state and the next reward. Okay. Okay. Um, and given this uh, sort of transitions that the agent has seen, um, and also the rewards that the agent has seen for this particular environment, can imagine in a model-based approach that the agent might first estimate the transition dynamics and estimate the reward function. And given those estimates, it can then plan what to do next. And then from, those, from that plan, it can pick an action to send to the environment, and the environment would then send the next state and reward back to the agent. That increases the data set that the uh, agent has. 
it updates its estimates of the transitions and the reward function, and the, the whole thing repeats itself. Okay. So in this sort of context, there are two things that we should think about. Firstly, um, well, they are both related to estimating the transition and the reward function. Uh, firstly, um, given that the data set that the agent has seen from this environment is small, so we want to have efficient learning, there has to be uncertainty in our estimates here. right? And that uncertainty is actually important to propagate that uncertainty in terms to the, to the planning process because if you don't take into account the uncertainty, then the planner will actually take advantage of whatever inaccuracies that the agent has, that the estimated transitions and rewards is, is produced in, in the previous stage. Right? And this could lead it to kind of pick actions that it thinks is useful, but it turns out not to be useful at all. Okay. Um, something else that we should also think about is that in this estimation problem, uh, it's based on a small amount of data, then, and again, prior knowledge has to appear in that, in that estimation problem, okay. somehow. Okay. And, right, so now let's focus on this es uh, estimation problem, which you can think of as a, basically a function regression problem, in which given a history, we would like to regress to learn about the next state and the next reward. Okay, so um, given that this is a functional regression problem and we would like to kind of take into account uh, uncertainties in our, in our estimation of the functions, a sensible thing to do is to do something like um, a Gaussian process, for example. Right? So we're going to have a bunch of inputs, which I'm going to denote by x in the future, and outputs y. Okay? So we have a set of input outputs and we want to estimate a function that would map from inputs to outputs. Um, if you want to account for prior knowledge and you can account for uncertainty, then one possibility is to do Bayesian inference over functions. And, and a sensible prior that we might use is a Gaussian process. Okay. So the kernel for the Gaussian process would express our prior distribution over functions that, are, uh, that we think of as sensible. And there's a posterior which captures the uncertainty in that function as well. And in fact, uh, people have used this Gaussian process approach in terms of model-based reinforcement learning. So this work, uh, Pilko by Mark Dissenroth and Carl Rasmussen some years ago. Uh, but the problem here that we'd like to address is the fact that, yes, a Gaussian process allows us to express prior knowledge, but oftentimes it's actually quite difficult to choose our kernels well. Okay? And oftentimes we have to learn our kernels as well. Okay? And the uh, approach that we're going to take is to replace a Gaussian process with something else which we're going to call a neural process. Okay? So basically we're going to use a neural network to learn behaviors, um, to learn actually a distribution over sensible functions from a bunch of, from data from a bunch of tasks. Right, so um, just going back towards kind of Gaussian processes. Um, so Gaussian processes are typically described using its marginal distributions. So given that if f is a Gaussian process, then the uh, function values on a finite set of inputs, we know it's going to be Gaussian distributed with some mean and some covariance. And the covariance here is given by the kernel. Okay. And different choices of kernel leads to different functions that have high probability under the Gaussian process. So you can... For example, we can choose the length scale of the kernel, um, which affects the kind of smoothness of the, um, of the Gaussian process. And different kernels, so this is, a, I think, a, uh, what's, it, what's it called again? Uh, onstein ullenbeck process, and that's a kernel with a square exponential, and this is, a, I guess, a, um, a quadratic kernel, which produces quadratic functions. Um, but the difficulty here is that we have to choose an analytic form of the kernel and it's often quite difficult to, to have kernels which are specific to a, a specific set of domain that we're interested in. Okay, okay. so um, a Gaussian process can actually be equivalently be described only by its conditional distributions. And what are the conditional distributions? Um, here that I'm talking about is basically given 
that the function at x1 takes on some value y1 and the function all the way until the function at input xt takes on some output yt. And you can think of that as a, the conditioning set or the training set for the function. And what we're interested in in terms of the conditional distribution is the distribution on the function outputs on a test input. Okay. And, and in the case of a Gaussian process, this has a closed form, which is, uh, which is a Gaussian as well. And in general, uh, stochastic processes or distributions on functions that we might be interested in can also be described using a consistent family of conditional distributions. Okay, so, and, and we know this from, from a Bayesian non-parametrics. Okay, so if I, if I can tell you a set of conditional distributions of this form, given a training set, what's the distribution of the function values on some test inputs? Okay. And, in, and if I can describe this for all possible training sets and, and test sets, then that will, and if this set of conditional distributions are consistent uh, in some way, then they would define a distribution on functions. Okay. And the basic idea of neural processes is basically simply to use a neural process, a neural network, to parameterize this conditional distributions. Okay. So just to recall, our neural network has to take as input. So basically, we're going to approximate this conditional distributions. Okay. So the neural network has to take as input a training set and outputs a conditional distribution on test inputs. Okay. Right. So here's our training set. We have, we have our input images, some output labels. Um, and the way we're going to structure our ne neural network is as follows. We're going to take this input-output pairs, pass, it through, pa pass each pair to a neural network. Could be con confnets or uh, multi-layer per perceptrons and so forth. That outputs a vector that's going to describe this particular input-output pair. Okay. And then we're going to sum up these vectors. Okay. And that's, that sum that summed up vector we can think of as a parameter that is going to describe the, the training sets, the whole training set. Okay? Um, and given this parameter vector, we can then uh, use that to parameterize a function that would then take an input image, test input image, and outputs a distribution on labels. Okay? Um, and the parameters that we want to optimize in this neural network are actually what I call the meta parameters here. The idea here is that these are the parameters that describe the neural networks here and here. Okay. And um, the choice of this particular architecture is kind of reasonable because uh, we expect our neural network to be invariant to permuting the, the training set. And this sum here enforces that, that, in, uh, it, that invariance. Okay. Right, so we have a neural network like that. And we would like to train this neural network to, on a bunch of data sets, right? Because um, we, want to take, we, we want to get this neural network to learn a stochastic process, a distribution on functions. And in order to, for it to learn a distribution on functions, we need to show it data corresponding to a variable to a variety of functions that are, that are likely under our prior. Okay. So we have a bunch of data sets. Each data set corresponds to a different function. And we can split that data set into a training part and a test part. Okay. And basically, uh, we can put the training part into our, uh, as input to our ne ne neural process, which then, and the neural process then outputs predictions for each of the test outputs. And all we're going to do is simply to uh, optimize the parameters of this neural network to have high probability of the test output given the test input and our training set. Okay? And this is kind of a standard log likelihood objective that we use. Um, and we have a distribution over data sets or tasks, and that's going to be our distribution. Okay, so um, 
If you're familiar with, I think, the recent literature on, on meta-learning, this is basically a probabilistic perspective on meta-learning, okay? In the sense that um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to have a neural network that can take a, a small training set and get it to generalize to, to test sets sensibly. And the way we're going to train our system is by showing it lots of small ex data sets, each of which is an example of generalizing from a training set to a test set. So that's the, the, the typical setup for meta-learning. Okay. Right, so just to kind of quickly go through. So typically for meta-learning, a standard benchmark data set that people use is called mini image nets, where we might have a training set of images and class labels and we would like the system to generalize to test sets of different images, and we want the, the system to kind of label which of this is a terrier, which of this is a beagle, and so forth. And we're going to train our system by uh, kind of learning this uh, to generalize from the training bit of each data set to the test bit of each data set. Right, and the typical perspective on meta-learning that people take is an optimization-based perspective. We think of the, the base learner as an optimizer that would take a training set, produces an optimized set of parameters that is then gives a, a predictor, which we can then evaluate on the, on the test data. And the idea of meta-learning is to optimize the parameters of this uh, base learner with respect to its meta-parameters or its hyper-parameters. Okay? And we can do this if the whole thing is differentiable to back-propagate through the whole system to optimize the hyper-parameters. Okay? So this is a typical view on meta-learning, which is an optimization-based view. Um, it, since I'm kind of running low on time, um, I'd like to kind of say that um, basically, if you think about the whole process here, uh, we have a distribution on tasks, and the agent gets to see a training set and a test set under that distribution on tasks. Okay. So really, from a probabilistic perspective, the best that the agent can do is actually to infer a posterior distribution on tasks and use that posterior distribution to help it make predictions on the test bit. Okay. Um, and you can think of the task identity itself as a latent variable that the agent doesn't get to see. It only gets to see the, the training data set. Okay. Right. And um, you know, from uh, probabilistic modeling, we know how to deal with latent variables and unknowns. Right. Um, so uh, the typical approach is uh, variational autoencoders in deep generative models, where we have a latent variable which represents uh, the, the data item that the uh, system sees. Um, and we have a decoder, which is the generative bit, okay, that actually generates the actual observations given the uh, latent variables. We also have an encoder, which takes uh, observed data and produces a posterior distribution over latent variables. And we can think of this as amortized inference. We're amortizing the optimization of the posterior distribution over multiple uh, inputs x, okay, by training a neural network that produces that posterior distribution. In the meta-learning context, our data is, our tra is a, an actual data training data set. Um, and we have an encoder which produces a representation of the task, uh, which actually could be a posterior distribution over tasks. Okay? And this has to be an, uh, a, a neural network that takes this training data set and outputs that. And we can think of this as actually amortized learning as opposed to amortized inference, because we're actually learning about this particular task from its corresponding training data set. And then we can use that to decode in a generative model, which allows us to produce a distribution over test outputs given test inputs. And this is exactly the structure that we have for our uh, neural process. Okay. So uh, viewing actually meta-learning as 
learning a stochastic process, which is how we came to the idea of a neural process, is interesting because we can now think about using similar sort of technology, but applying it to different problems that we might see that's different from few shot image classification. Okay, so, so for example, we can apply it to functions in one dimension, so which is, and you can, and uh, here we have a training set given by the red dots, and the output predictions is the mean and the uh, standard deviation. Okay, and as we increase the uh, number of items in our training sets, the uh, predictions initially had high uncertainty, and as we, it sees more data, the, its uncertainty kind of decreases over time. And this behavior is similar to, uh, to actually a Gaussian process. Okay. But you can do different things. So I'd um, like to kind of show uh, uh, applying this neural process to model-based reinforcement learning. So here our uh, distribution on functions is obtained by uh, is it functions on the transition dynamics for different parameterizations of this cut pole task. So the task here is to get uh, this piece of wood to point up. Okay. And different parameterizations could be things like the length of the wood, its mass, and the kind of the force that the um, agent can ac can exert going left or right. Okay. And we can see that after a very small number of episodes, actually, the, 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 the system can, has pretty much learned how to, to kind of, uh, have the wood pointing upwards. Okay. Right. Uh, you can also do this for diff quite different sorts of things because you know, if a neural process is simply a generalization of Gaussian process to kind of arbitrary stochastic processes, which we can learn from data, then we can do things like this. So for example, we can think of each task as an image, okay, that is a two-dimensional function. Okay. So it's a function that takes a pixel location, outputs a pixel value, intensity, or color, and that's simply an, an image. Okay. And if we train an, our neural process on a set of face images, then um, we can use it for doing things like, for example, predicting the bottom half of the image given the top half, or super resolution where we give it observation of only four pixels and it has to extrapolate to how the whole face looks like. Okay. And the fact that this is a stochastic process, we can also look at variability in terms of these predictions. Okay, so we can imagine, you can see that here are all the different face images that are consistent with that four by four grid of observations. Uh, over there, those are all the different low, low level bits of the face that's consistent with the upper bit of the face. Okay. And you can see that there's variability in the functions um, that the neural process is predicting. So you can do things like super resolution. Um, so given a low resolution image, predict a high resolution one. Okay. So this is the outputs of the neural process as compared to an kind of an interpolation baseline where we simply interpolate um, on a neighboring pixels. And the thing that's interesting here is that if you look at this particular image, uh, in the low resolution bit, we don't actually see that the eye has the white bits of the eye at all. And the neural process has learned enough about this particular distribution on functions to understand that, that, you know, that the eye has the white bits of the eye. Okay. Um, even when that information is actually missing from the low resolution image. Okay. Uh, another interesting thing with this is that actually all of these uh, results are based on a single trained uh, neural process that can do uh, bottom half prediction, super resolution at different uh, re uh, resolutions and so forth. Okay. Uh, the final thing, just one more minute, is we can also, uh, one of the most uh, successful applications of Gaussian processes is in Bayesian optimization where we want to minimize an unknown function uh, with respect to, uh, yeah, we just want to minimize an unknown function. Okay. And we've used this for adversarial testing of RL agents. So the idea here is that we have an agent that's trained and it's 
does really well in terms of navigating around this maze. But what we would like to know ab um, about is um, whether, the, uh, whether there are mazes which confuses the agents, right? Because this agent could look very good in terms of typical mazes that we show it, but there could be things that confuses it. And that's useful because we want to know about failure modes of our trained agents. And we can formalize this as a Bayesian optimization problem where the function that we want to minimize is actually the reward of the agent with respect to the map and the starting location and the goal location. Okay. And we formalize this as a Bayesian optimization. But of course, you can imagine that you know, it's not really clear how you might define a Gaussian process on, on such a domain, but you could do. Uh, uh, but what we did was we actually did a Gaussian process version, but we also did uh, actually a uh, neural process version, and uh, this is uh, the neural process is much more efficient because the um, uh, distribution on functions is kind of specialized to this particular domain. Okay, uh, this is the last slide, really. So, um, so in the first step of the Bayesian optimization, the agent can quickly find the goal. Uh, by the fifth step of the Bayesian optimization, uh, we, uh, the, the system has come up with a maze that is somewhat confusing for the agents, and it takes the agent a while before it found the goal. By the tenth step of the um, Bayesian optimization, it has found a maze where the agent just keeps on loop looping around this. So it's kind of found a failure mode for the agent, in a sense. So the agent never actually found the goal in this case. So on that kind of note, I'd like to end. So um, I think that um, prior knowledge or inductive biases are important in terms of efficient learning, fast learning. And I've talked about two different forms that this can take. We have knowledge about what is in the environment. And we also have knowledge about how to solve the tasks. So kind of in terms of the policies, reusable parts of the policy. Okay. And I'd like to end by talking about, you know, there's different sources of prior knowledge that we could use in, in machine learning. We've played around a lot with things like designing our features, engineering our features, our losses, our neural architectures, and so forth. There's also been a lot of work around augmenting our data sets to kind of as a form of prior knowledge. Um, in this work, we've talked about using related tasks to learn our prior knowledge from data. But we can also use kind of data from other mod modalities as well. So in the case of the human uh, gait um, work, the data is coming from demonstration from mocap data that's different from the RL domains that we were interested in. Okay. Um, and I'd like to kind of end by kind of emphasizing that I think as machine learners, um, we should go from engineering our learning systems to thinking about how do we um, how do we uh, impart prior knowledge about, the, uh, about our world or about the world that we want our agents to, to do well in? Um, how do we impart our prior knowledge to that agent by thinking about different ways in which we could uh, do that and kind of uh, allowing machine learning systems that can allow us to more easily deal with this sort of questions as opposed to simply the the learning bit and the neural architectures bit. Okay, so thank you.